Business Training Series on Revenue Cycle Management. Uh, this is our fourth and uh, final uh, presentation on Revenue Cycle Management. It, it will focus on remittance, appeals, collection, and analysis. Uh, my name is uh, Boris Vilgorin, and I'm the Chief uh, Healthcare Officer at NYU MCTAC, and I'll be doing the presentation today. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping rules. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please make sure you chat them uh, through the, the chat box that you should have on the uh, lower right-hand corners, and we'll be um, taking all those questions at the end of the presentation and uh, trying to answer. If we can get to all the questions um, at the end of the presentation, um, we still um, answer those and uh, we'll be replying through our FAQs. Also, please note that this uh, presentation um, is posted on our uh, website, which is mctac.org. And uh, this presentation, I believe, will be um, recorded as well, and the recording will be posted later in the week or early next week. But the, uh, web, uh, the presentation itself is already available uh, on the website. So let's uh, jump right into it. Um, so one, for those who might be joining us for the first time, just a quick overview of what MCTAC is, which is the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. Um, and we are a training, consultation, and educational resource center that offers uh, resources to all mental health and substance use disorder providers in New York State, and our goal is uh, to, of course, provide training and intensive support on quality improvement strategies, including business, organizational, and clinical practices, uh, to really achieve the overall goal of preparing and assisting providers uh, with a transition to managed care, especially Medicaid managed care is the focus. And a couple of uh, just overarching facts uh, before we jump into um, the last component of the revenue cycle management, just to again um, make sure that we're all on the same page, um, that one is that Medicaid managed care plans will be required to contract with providers to serve five or more of their enrolled individuals. Um, and they also, meaning managed care, will be required to pay the Medicaid fee, uh, fees um, for um, you know, the services that occur on the Medicaid rates. Uh, of course, the, you know, if an authorization is required, uh, that still needs to be obtained, and, and more information on authorization um, and what's required will be forthcoming. Um, and for those who are, are not aware, the HCBS uh, rates are listed on the HCBS fee schedule on the OMH and the OASIS websites. Um, there's also uh, other manuals about uh, HCBS-specific services that are available um, on those websites. So what is revenue cycle uh, management or revenue cycle as it's defined? It's an all administrative and clinical function that contributes to the capture management and collection of client service revenue. This describes the life cycle of a client account from creation to payment collection and re uh, resolution. Um, the cycle uh, has many different activities, of course, bill, billing and billable, and uh, that it meets regulation requirements and revenue collection is maximized. Um, but it really is um, the full cycle, everything from the registration, which was the first presentation, all the way down to the collection, posting, uh, appeals process, and analysis, which we will focus on today. Um, it's a full cycle, and just to underscore, the revenue cycle is all administrative and clinical functions. And as with previous uh, presentations, um, we have underscored that this is not just a financial function. It is not just about billing. Um, it really encompasses all components and everybody um, who serves the individuals or supports um, staff that serve the individual directly. Um, and that includes the front desk, uh, the intake worker, the clinician, the finance department, of course, um, executive offices, and, and so forth. So it involves the, the full cycle and involves uh, the agency as a whole to uh, be focused, pay attention, 
um, and make sure that it's um, moving forward. So uh, this is just to highlight the component, which is again the last piece uh, of the revenue cycle management. Um, just uh, again to highlight that the, the middle circle that talks about contract management, quality assurance, utilization review, credentialing, um, and regulatory compliance is uh, important pieces throughout the cycle um, as it uh, pertains to each particular area and cannot be forgotten in regards to uh, its components as well and uh, the incorporation of those components. Um, another way to look at the revenue cycle uh, management is uh, looking at it as what happens prior to the service, what happens during the services, and what's happening following the service, and of course, uh, what should be done ongoing. Um, so today we'll focus on the last piece of what happens following the service and of course the things that need to be ongoing uh, throughout the process. So what is remittance? Um, remittance is uh, posting and applying payments and adjustments to the client accounts and posting payments in aggregate amounts to the general ledger. So posting uh, or remittance is really uh, two components. One is taking the, the results, if you will, both the payments um, that came back or denials or other types of uh, responses and posting it directly uh, to the client level and actually to the service level. And then, of course, taking that information and moving it over to the general ledger. So this way, both um, you can analyze it as we talk for, uh, later on and look at it on a very specific individual client and the service level, but of course, as an overall, what does it mean to the financial health of your organization and how did that impact um, that part of uh, the financial picture? Um, so what should be considered um, in regards to remittance process? Um, one uh, important piece is to think about is uh, how timely or what is the, the time um, you know it takes for you to receive that remittance and post it. Um, is it manually posted, meaning you're getting paper remittances and posting it in a, through the data entry process, or is it in the electronic posting where it goes directly into your billing system? Um, and, and gets posted uh, through, through that. If it's an electronic payment posting, it's uh, referred to as an electronic payment advice, um, and, or 835 is another term that it could be referred to in an electronic uh, way. Um, and of course, it's an electronic transaction which provides claim payment information uh, in a HIPAA mandated format, of course. Um, and it could be used by practices, facilities, and billing companies to auto-post claims. Um, I know most uh, providers who bill Medicaid um, electronically um, get uh, postings back from Medicaid electronically as well, and depending, of course, on your electronic health system or the billing system, um, it would go down to the actual service level. That is clearly the best way um, to post anything. It's the most efficient and timely. If the posting is manual, uh, meaning that you're getting paper, um, EOBs could be in Medicaid or managed care arena. Um, you need to really look and see what the, the time frame of it. Because uh, in any rebuild, um, if you need to do the rebilling or even following up with uh, claims and doing the analysis, the timeliness of posting um, your remittance becomes a crucial component. Okay, so why choose an EPA, meaning again, um, an electronic posting, as I've mentioned, it increases efficiency, <clears throat> it reduces resources. Um, you don't need individuals to sit there all day doing data entry. Uh, it also reduces the errors, because uh, it's a, a direct link between the remittance um, right into your system, and of course it reduces time uh, and it's the timely posting of it. Uh, are there clear guidelines on how fast the payments needs to be posted? 
and uh, what happens if the payment is received and cannot be matched to a client and or a, ser or a service. Um, the clear guidelines is to post it as fast as possible and as soon as possible. Uh, again, in a paper uh, data entry that becomes tricky, um, you know, sometimes it could take, you know, up to a week or two weeks for things get posted depending on the volume and the resources available. Sometimes those resources get shortchanged um, in regards to the, po uh, uh, the posting. Um, the checks will be cashed, uh, but the actual information doesn't always get into the system uh, right away. And what happens if, if you cannot match um, what has been uh, returned? Um, of course, the payer should be contacted, uh, maybe a discussion with the program. Um, it also depends, is it a client, meaning you can't find uh, a client in your system? Um, is it a client but a service doesn't match? And depending on the variation of um, that mismatch will depend on the possible next steps um, you would need to take. And of course, um, if needed, uh, the payer might need to be contacted and if, uh, if it was uh, inappropriately paid, of course, the, the money would need to be returned. So um, the other piece of posting or remittance that sometimes, or a lot of times, I should say, um, gets uh, shortchanged as well is comparing on how much money was received versus billed and reconciling those differences. So in, in a lot of systems, as long as there was a payment made, um, that kind of gets posted, and the reports um, that later get run are more focused on denials um, or things that have not been paid, each receivables and, and, and other things. And of course, that is important to, to focus on um, and to keep your eye on because you haven't received any money or you were denied. However, um, there are instances and, and many reasons uh, why your payment might be less or sometimes even more than what was expected. One of those could clearly be um, your expectation of what should have been paid um, is, is mismatched, the one really should be getting paid, um, or the payer is uh, paying you uh, incorrectly. And unless there's somebody who's responsible to review those rooms, remittances in general um, to reconcile those differences and, uh, and have an established process um, to manage what I would refer to under and over payments or usually refer to as under and over payments. Those get forgotten until maybe a year later or when there's a, a close of a fiscal year and it seems like everything was going well um, but then there is a realization that there is a, a short, uh, a short uh, dollars or dollars don't match uh, what should have been um, in the bank, and of course there's a whole process and potentially, you know, uh, you know everybody gets involved trying to reconcile it, and of course going back a year is uh, never a good idea. It's uh, the best thing to do is try to catch it as soon as possible and either address it within your own system. If there is um, some sort of, um, you know, error in regards to what should be expected or how things are getting built, um, or definitely uh, address it with a payer, you know, the managed care company to find out why um, the claims are, you know, being paid under the amount, or even in some instances overpayments. Um, and sometimes folks, um, especially with overpayments, pay even less attention. Um, but it doesn't mean that the managed care company or any payer uh, will not come later to collect those differences if they were um, incorrectly paid. So either way, um, there needs to be a responsible party um, who reviews the remittances in total um, but does not forget about the under and over payments and also looks to make sure that the system um, that you're currently operating has those capabilities. And of course, um, you know, the adjustments, um, if there are any adjustments, um, you know, that the payer is making should be incorporated into your system. Um, and then what is the, the process in an agreed upon process, I should say, that the information that comes from 
your billing information, remittance information gets into the general ledger. I know in a number of uh, organizations, um, there might be certain um, amounts or certain expectations or certain dollars that don't necessarily make it over to general ledger for many different reasons. Um, and But everybody um, who who's involved in revenue cycle management needs to understand what is that process and uh, who records the revenue in general ledger and who makes decisions um, on what gets recorded. Is it a one-to-one? -one? Are there any adjustments that are made internally uh, to account for certain things or to account for certain risk um, and so forth and, and making sure that the, the final financial statement that usually um, comes from the general ledger is in line to what's happening in the remittance process. And if it's not, what are those discrepancies and that folks understand why they're there. So after the, one of the components of the remittance is an uh, unfortunate component, but it does exist, is the denial process. Um, meaning that your claims are denied and, and a certain uh, process then kicks in. Of course, um, in, in the best case scenario, if you get denials, it is better to try to handle that through, uh, if it's, if it's uh, a small amount of claims on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, if it's, if it's a, a larger number of claims or it seems like um, the claims are getting denied. You cannot seem to be um, able to revert or reverse those denials. Um, all managed care companies have an appeals process. Um, and one is your organization clearly needs to understand that appeals process, understand is it related to utilization management uh, component of it, uh, meaning that it was a lack of obtaining authorization, maybe medical necessity, was it an administrative denial, and what would be um, the appeals process uh, for that? And uh, how do you do conflict resolution? Um, and uh, liability issues is, is not, you know, are there liability issues uh, that are not providing a service even if the MCO denies the payment? And, and that's um, really what happens if there's denials and, and how would you handle that on a client level and, and dealing with the client. Um, you know, and the, the first uh, thing is to really, the first step, I should say, um, in, in the utilization management or authorization process um, is to request that a call take place between the MCO and the treating provider. So really getting on the phone, um, talking to somebody at managed care, uh, understanding who to talk to in managed care about it and trying to resolve it um, is the best way. There are other appeals processes that um, uh, MCOs have. Um, I would uh, invite folks to get familiar with those um, through the, you know, their website, their manuals, um, and of course, when you're on the phone with the managed care company um, doing the appeal, asking uh, about different levels of appeal, and, and also internally considering um, the return on investment that it would take to appeal um, certain claims versus uh, how much it might cost you with all the administrative functionings versus what are you getting back for those appeals. Um, clearly, on a high level of care, the more expensive care, like inpatient care, um, appeals um, is, is, a, is a process that is applied because uh, it could be thousands of dollars just for one um, bill or one claim. Um, when you get down to clinics or other services, um, not to say you should not, you should definitely appeal if, if your agency has that process and is willing to do it, um, but you need to take into account, you know, what is your return on investment on that. Um, so again, this is the, the link, and again, as I mentioned, it's on our um, website, and uh, so I invite you to, to look this up, and there's a link in regards to the Medicaid Managed Care Provider Guide that talks more about the appeals process and the options that are uh, available uh, to the providers. Um, 
And of course, if it's non-clinical, non-UM related, and it's more administrative denials, agency should be in uh, contact with their managed care representatives to discuss their options. Um, but uh, the main goal is to monitor all of this and to make sure that as much as possible, um, you stop kind of the, the ongoing denials if it's especially administrative and if it's something that you can fix on your end. Uh, sometimes it's not necessarily something on your end. It might be on the managed care end. But either way, making them aware of it um, and, of course, internally being aware of it is an important process. And then discussing it with the representative um, on how you can resolve uh, your denials that already happened. And of course, all of it requires analysis, reporting, overview, and making sure um, that you stay on top of it. So review and evaluate the effectiveness of your revenue cycle management and the performance of your payers. So it's an ongoing review um, of is your revenue cycle management accomplishing um, what you set to accomplish, and that is really in revenue maximization, meaning that for every service you provide, um, your goal is to get paid. And if it's not, um, what might be the problems or barriers to that? Um, who else might need to get involved? Or how do you improve the process? You need to create and analyze standard metrics to identify issues and processes that may need improvement. Um, so some of it is, I already talked about, is denial reports, over underpayments, each receivable reports are just few um, of the reports um, and then the matrix uh, metrics uh, that are identified or related to it. <clears throat> um, excuse me. And quantify issues related to payers and discuss with your customer service representatives or your managed or your representatives. So uh, you know the the typical thing or um, or common you know folks will call up a managed care company and say I'm getting denied. Um, I want to get paid and have uh, limited information on what it is, how much it is, you know, is it an ongoing issue, um, is it specific to a particular program or a particular staff member or client. Being able to get down to that level, I think, is very important. And, uh, and, and of course, understanding what is your collection ratio. And that is, of course, totally collected. Uh, what is collected versus uh, by payer and by payer class. As you look at the uh, age um, reports, are you breaking it down to, you know, the common type of breakdowns? Your agency might uh, have a different um, threshold here, um, but in a lot of places you might be looking at things that are less than 30 days which are probably still in process and something just to be aware of, but not necessarily uh, take action. Uh, 30 to 60 days, um, you know, you might want to start looking into it and seeing uh, what's going on. Um, in New York, uh, I believe the, the law or the standard is that managed care has up to 45 days to pay. Um, so that's still within that frame. I think when you get to 60 to 90 days and definitely 90 to 120 days, that is something that should be followed up on to see um, what is going on. Have they received those claims? Um, what might be the issues um, with that? And, and really keeping your eye on anything that's uh, 60 days plus. Um, uh, the denial report, what is your percentage and the amount of claims denied by reason, clinician, and payer? Are you at 2%, 5%, 15%, 25%? And again, are there specific uh, companies, specific um, reasons or clinicians? Can you slice and dice those denial reports? Um, and another key component that folks um, sometimes forget, and that's more about the cash flow, is the percentage of claims paid upon initial submission. So when you... Uh, bill the managed care company and uh, let's say within the 30 days you get uh, remittances on all of them or most of them, what is the rate um, you get paid uh, on those versus if you look at six months later? So what might happen is you might get 60 to 70% payment 
an initial submission, then you have denials, you work through some of those denials, you might eventually get to 85, 90, 95%, um, and maybe even 98% if you're one of those few lucky ones. Um, but then did it take you six months to get there, um, and what happened to the cash uh, while you were working through all of that? And of course, the under and over reports um, that are important, uh, again, to, to keep in mind. And as with everything else, you have to have an ongoing process of improvement. You have to formalize the process using your analytics to identify problems, create solutions, implement change, and measure the results. Um, unless you have that, you know, it's very hard to really pinpoint where the problems might be and, and really try to solve those. Um, it becomes more like shooting in the dark. Excuse me. So who is responsible for the analysis? Um, have you discussed this um, internally? Is there one individual that's doing this? Is there a group that's looking at it? And then how is that information shared and communicated to others? Is it just an email that goes out? Um, is it a shared drive that folks need to be aware of and log in and to look at it? Um, how is that really being shared? And do individuals who are looking at this analysis understand the analysis um, and, and what is actionable? Meaning, so I get a report, um, another uh, problem that I have run into over the years is I would get a report, I would look at it, I would say this is very nice, and I would file it, and I would uh, put it away. And that's in the best case scenario, um, but not really understand is there a responsibility for me is there something I need to do with this information um, and take action, uh, or is it somebody else um, that's going to be taking action? So being able to highlight that and, and underscore that for individuals is very important. And of course, again, just with uh, everything else, it come, always comes back to process uh, improvement. So understanding who's doing the analysis, um, how is it shared, and understanding who is responsible to take action that is written somewhere in, in a formalized process, either through a workflow, either through policies and procedure, a combination of both um, is important. And then the group should get together uh, on a regular basis to look at the uh, process, to see if it's working, to see if it needs improvement, um, and, uh, and, if, and if it does, you know, implement the changes. But again, in the same format where it's formalized, it's agreed upon and understand, you know, and, and all of the individuals involved very much understand what, what that new process is. So just a, a little cartoon towards the end of the presentation. Um, and just, you know, as you kind of learn all these things and get all this information, um, you might say to yourself, if I'd known they wanted me to use all this information, I would have never asked for it. So another way of saying it is be careful what you ask for, uh, but on the flip side is if you don't know this information, uh, be careful what you don't know because uh, later on it might be too late. So some of the resources um, just to, to make sure folks are aware of. Um, so part of the qualification process, plans are required to develop and implement a comprehensive provider training and support program for network providers. Um, so one of the things that's uh, being implemented and, and the training program will involve is billing and coding um, and so forth. So you should be looking out for information on that uh, coming uh, towards you in, in regards to the webinars and or in-person meetings. Um, and of course, as we get closer, especially for New York City, um, to the implementation date, uh, starting a submission uh, of testing and to work, you know, in kind of a in test environment is, is very helpful. Um, and also here's the, some other resources uh, to be continued in regards to the Office of Mental Health Resources.
and in regards to HARP, uh, mainstream uh, behavioral health billing and coding, uh, just some of the manuals um, for this. Coding and taxonomy, uh, additional uh, information from OMH website in regards to uh, what codes and taxonomy, and uh, you really should be very much um, familiar with your, uh, you know, with the OMH uh, and the OASIS website and all the possible uh, resources um, that are available there um, in regards to manuals. Um, and other coding information. As I mentioned before, the ATBS fee schedule um, is available um, on the website, and this is just some of the resources when you're able to uh, go to the mictac.org website, you'll be able to copy and uh, paste or direct link into those uh, manuals. Uh, in addition to the rate tables, And uh, this really completes the, our, our presentation. This just highlights all of the uh, core content area for the revenue cycle management we have done. Uh, we're at number four. Uh, just the, the schedule um, of, of these presentations. And of course, as always, please feel free to submit uh, any questions um, uh, to the mictech.info at nyu.edu, and uh, we'll be more than happy to reply to to those. And um, for, uh, thank you for the participation. Again, our website is mictech.org, um, and now we'll turn into the uh, question and answers. All right. We'll just give folks. Uh, a minute or so to, to see if there's any questions. All right, again, for the questions, please use uh, the chat box. We also have a number of resources on our uh, website, mctech.org. If you haven't checked out the matrix, uh, I strongly recommend it. It provides, uh, at least at the moment, for New York City providers, and we'll be expanding to the rest of the state shortly on all the information on the managed care plans um, within uh, New York City, and the same type of a process uh, will be expanding for the rest of the state. Okay, there's a question about the agency is not listed in the rate table, what action is needed. Um, I would suggest you contact your um, licensing body or certification body, either OMH or ACES, to discuss uh, that with them and see what might have happened. Let's see if there's any other questions that uh, Give it another minute, otherwise I don't want folks to hold up anybody. And again, with uh, invite folks to email us uh, the questions. Uh, so the, there's a question about what's the best way to get the MCOs to pay the federal uh, rate? Um, there is uh, really, uh, as far as I know, again, in regards to federal rates, which are, I assume, the individuals referring to Medicare, because uh, those are the only federal rates that I'm aware of, um, that's really when you deal with the Medicare plans, it's really between you um, and the managed care company right now for managed Medicaid. Um, that's the only for two years, as I've mentioned, the rates are guaranteed for the Medicaid component of this. Um, you know, otherwise, um, outside of that, you're in negotiation with a, a managed care company. Uh, 
All right. Um, so I, I think with, with that, I'm going to end here. And again, thank everybody for joining me. And uh, please uh, feel free to email us any questions you might have. Uh, thank you.